The Manx Wildlife Trust started life as the Manx Nature Conservation Trust in March of 1973. It came into existence following letters written to the papers in 1970 by Felicity Kane and Elizabeth Hamm, calling on Ireland residents to do something in recognition of the European Conservation Year. Over the years, the Trust has expanded its operation, setting up reserves, opening visitor centres, growing its number of specialist staff and moving to its own headquarters in Peel with a shop and information centre. Its overall ethos, however, has remained much the same, driving the development of a nature recovery network across the Isle of Man to create more places for wildlife, championing nature-based solutions to enable nature to improve the wider Isle of Man environment for everyone and connecting people in the Isle of Man strongly to nature and inspiring them to act for wildlife. As it enters its 51st year, I had a brief chat with the current CEO, Lee Morris, and community ranger, Hannah Phillips, about their work, what's changed over the years, and what they would like to see in the future. Hello, my name's Hannah Phillips, and I'm the community ranger for Max Wildlife Trust. Hi, Lee Morris. I'm CEO of Max Wildlife Trust. Probably in some ways, the difference between the organisation and when it started out, in many ways, it's really the same. What's what's been really interesting for me is delving into some of the old newsletters from the last 20, 30, 40 years and looking at one recently that I dug out for a particular article that was referenced of about 15 years ago and it could have been written yesterday. So in some ways, we're, we've kept our traditional values of conserving nature and looking after nature reserves and, and I think all that is really strong and engage, you know, educating people and being really important part of the Manx culture for wildlife but I think as we look forward for, for, for Manx Wildlife Trust and the whole of the Wildlife Trust Federation there is a bit of a step change going on right now coincidentally around our 50th year where we're really trying to I guess think bigger um, and that's part of, of, of my colleague Hannah's role in being engaging more with community and, and David who's working with farmers and Adam and Sarah who are working with developers to try and do things on a, on a, on a bigger scale. And Hannah, we, we've spoken before and there's various podcasts you can go to where we've been speaking about various aspects of your job. But just give us a, a sort of little praise or a, a sort of a potted history, as it were, of what you actually do in your role as community ranger. Uh, so as community ranger, I try and encourage and help facilitate sort of community projects to do with wildlife around the island. So um, as Lee said we're sort of looking bigger at what we're trying to do but to be able to achieve this we need to work alongside um, everyone from all different sort of backgrounds and jobs and sectors so my role is sort of going out into the community and getting people helping wildlife sort of in their back door back doors in the back um, garden Mm. or in schools or churches or wherever wherever that might be. And do you think, Lee, is this something, as you, you hinted at there, has this been the massive change over the over the 50 years, or one of the big changes, I suppose I should say, this involvement with all levels of society? I think so, but with the caveat that although I've got an environmental career for 30 plus years, it's only three years plus in wildlife trusts. Um, but I've joined wildlife trusts at a time where I was I'm happy with the way that they're evolving is, is to think bigger. So there'll always be the traditional value of, you know, sound ecologists, people that love nature, you know, looking after and cherishing nature reserves. And, and that, I hope, never leaves the core of what a wildlife trust is. The, the, the big change now is that, for example, our nature reserves in the Isle of Man, which are brilliant, they cover in total less than 1% of the island. And however wonderful they are, as a charity and as an organisation, we can't fix or protect nature if we're only really influencing less than 1% of it. Where, for example, now we're the delivery partner for the Agri-Environment Scheme for DEFA, and and agriculture covers 75% of the island. So just imagine the potential influence Max Wildlife Trust could have with small gains for nature over 75% of the island. It's a it's a real opportunity for us to work collaboratively, but we can't do that on our own because we can't possibly, you know, farm every farm, so to speak, even if we wanted to. So we've got to work really closely with other people. And, and is, this, is, is this part of the role going forward then? Because you're talking about David Bellamy's role in the Agri-Environment Scheme, and we saw it uh, last year at the, the awards there, which the whole scheme was actually winning awards in the uh, Biodiversity uh, or Biosphere Awards, which were, happen every year. 
is this sort of something new again? Because I suppose in the past, and certainly thinking back, thinking in my sort of history going past, you, you would sort of have the, the government organisation and you'd have DEFA and then you'd have the NGOs, and in this case, you know, the Manx Wildlife Trust. And I wouldn't say they were at loggerheads, but perhaps it would be a case of, you know, that the policy would be made by government and then it might be challenged by some of the NGOs saying, well, that's all well and good, but what about this for the environment? Is is that something that's changed? I think I've thought a lot about this, both both in my role in the Isle of Man, but also in, in you know, past roles in, in, in different places. I've worked for NGOs, different environmental NGOs, ladies and government. I think there's probably not one size fits all. And, and, and around the world, tension sounds a bit dramatic, but there's certainly a difference between an NGO and what a government is. They're, 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 they've got different drivers, different pressures, different opportunities. Um, my approach, which does matter, I, I, I try and be humble and talk about the team, but also I've got to put my head above the parapet as the CEO of Max Wildlife Trust, and, and, and it does influence our culture. My view is that we've got to work pragmatically with people, and, and I don't want to, as an organisation, we're not going to agree with the, with the Isle of Man government all the time, but if I don't agree with them, I, we have a chat behind the scenes. I, and I think it's really important that we're, I would describe us as a challenging friend. We, we do lots of work with the government. We do lots of work for the government. Um, if we did nothing for the government and we lost those government contracts, Max Wildlife Trust would still exist. That's quite a nice position to be in. We're, we're, we're not dependent on government income. But we certainly want to do those projects more for actually the opportunity to influence nature than, you know, the money almost is just as allows us to do it. And, and I think that's that's an important dynamic. So, yeah, the, the, the NGO government thing is the, is different the world over. On my watch, I'm keen that we're that we work really positively with government as positively as we can be. But then when we need to disagree, um, we do that in a very, very professional way. So speaking like almost like being a sort of backbencher or something, you're there to question, as you say, if policies are made, which obviously are talking about the environment, something coming through DEF, then you're there as a, a non-government body to sort of review it. And if you feel questions need to be asked, then you ask them. Yes. And I think um, there would be there would be times when, you know, I would be quite happy to go and lay down in front of a bulldozer, metaphorically. But I th- I believe that you can get a lot more done if you're at the table. That's my personal standpoint, rather than outside with a placard. And so I think for Max Wildlife Trust, with our ambitions of really trying to make you know big change across hopefully lots of the island working with others, I think it's really important that we're sat at those tables working positively and pragmatically with, with, with government and other stakeholders to try and make the changes we like to see happen long term. And with your work, Hannah, I suppose you're more in, in a way at the cliff face, maybe, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong here, you're not working so much directly with the government organisations as with individuals and sort of, again, volunteer groups and such like and trying to actually engender a sort of enthusiasm, a love for the environment. And I know, again, we've spoken, sort of setting up working groups all made of volunteers and people who just want to make a difference in their own area, perhaps working in their own time. Yeah, I think so. I think what I do is it's more... Um, towards sort of championing individual action and um, encouraging people and um, showing that you can make a difference even if perhaps you don't have a garden or any outside space, there's still something you can do. So yeah, it's sort of more on the ground, helping individuals and empowering communities to sort of make those changes. And do you see a lot of it, or do you see a lot of enthusiasm as go around the island? Because again, I've often thought maybe in the last five, ten years, there seems to have been, and particularly post COVID, more people interested in their environment. Is that something you've picked up on perhaps in the last year or so? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just on people's radars a lot more. Like you said, with COVID, we came to appreciate our, you know, the outside space that we had a lot more. Um, and I think just there is, you know, more conversation about this now. I think people are becoming a bit more aware about sort of what's going on and the changes that need to be made. Um, And I think people, you know, are just becoming more aware about how the fact that, you know, if they help wildlife, encourage wildlife, it also makes them feel good as well and it's beneficial to them. And I think that sort of um, approach is is, um, spreading and people are sort of uh, tuning into it. And so people happy to buy in because I know that recently you've been working up in Onken and I think, again, with some of the reserves, almost sort of asking people to take charge of reserves in their area, keep an eye out, make sure it's clean and such like. Are people happy to, to, to buy into this? 
I think so, yeah. I mean, the, you know, from my experience, people are really enthusiastic. I think the approach that I'm coming from with the community engagement, it is all about, you know, um, empowering people and encouraging their um, individual action. You know, we're sort of there to help and facilitate. But really, if people can um, do these projects on their own, that's when they're going to feel more most passionate about it because it's something that they've created and it, it's their baby. Um, and we're just sort of there to help maybe with practical things. So definitely that's what we're really trying to encourage is, um, you know, people going out there and looking after their own outside space, even if it's communal or, you know, community space. Um, and that's what, you know... Um, at Max Wildlife Trust and through the whole Wildlife Trust this approach is called Team Wilder and it's all about going out into communities and getting people to do their independent action. And you mentioned the, the trust there, I didn't realise it was that lowly the uh, the actual land area because I mean there's 20, 26 reserves, is there 24? 27 now. 27. 27. Oh, close. But uh, where's the new one? Remind me where the new one is. Well, I would say Balan Quarry which is a partnership with Coalas is the latest. Yeah, so that's 27, which is a lot. But overall, as a landmass, what did you say? One, one it's, less than, it's actually less than half a percent of the island's wow. landmass. Which, again, on the one hand, 27 sounds a lot. Fantastic. And then when you put it that way, it sounds like sort of next to nothing. It's still 300 plus acres of it, it's a lot. really, really important nature. And actually, if I, I'll just re-emphasise, we bought a piece of land this year at Loch Cranstall. Um, and although the whole of the Wildlife Trust movement Manx Wildlife Trust, I guess, driven by me and the board, are saying that we need to work on a bigger landscape scale. We're really hoping that what the purchase of the land at Loch Cranstall shows, and actually a small piece of land that we're adding to Goshen as well, is that when a really important piece of nature space becomes on the market that we feel needs to be in perpetuity banked, so to speak, we'll still try and find a way to buy that and, and add that to a, a, as a new nature reserve. So it's not that that culture's gone from Max Wildlife Trust. That's still really important. And that's what I was thinking. So that's still very much on the agenda. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's always... The best way to protect something is to own it if you're a wildlife trust. But at the same time, as you, as you hinted at what you were saying there, you sort of bank it with something special. And yet, equally, obviously, there's 86, 87,000 people that were, were looking to grow the population yeah. on the Isle of Man. So presumably there's going to be more people, there's going to be more houses, there's going to be more areas built upon and such like. We, we have to live here, of course, um, as we know through the biosphere and such like. So whilst there's p areas which are protected outright, I suppose, for an awful lot of the rest of the landmass, it's a case of what sort of living, living with nature as, as effectively as we can, I suppose. Yes. And there's, there's three acronyms that, that I think are really important for us. One of them is AES, Agri-Environment Scheme. The other one is ESG, which is Environmental Social Governance. And the other one is BNG, which is Biodiversity Net Gain. So AES is really important to farmers and landowners. ESG is tremendously important and becoming more so every day with corporates and the businesses that are based in the Isle of Man. And BNG, Biodiversity Net Gain, is increasingly important with developers, property development, land development. And so those three things now are actually, in, in our ways, delightfully being driven towards more of an environmental, sustainable direction. Then you add the fact that we're the only whole nation biosphere in the world. And there's a real opportunity for Manx Wildlife Trust in our next 50 years to really capitalise on AES, BNG, ESG within a biosphere get more people on board with Team Wilder and and, and, and be a, an exemplar, I would say. I think that vision of us being an exemplar nation for that is really doable. And can you just explain again, I can hear people saying biodiversity net gain sounds yep. good. What's it mean in practice? Uh, it would mean that if you have a chunk of land, um, there is more biodiversity and wildlife, in simple terms, on it after you've done what you've done than when you started. And so imagine a blank piece of concrete and you put some grass turf on it. Well, that grass turf has, has got grass, there might be a couple of insects and some nematodes in it, and you've increased wildlife. Imagine then you plant a few wildflowers in it, or you put a tree in it, and then some birds land in the tree. And then a, you put a pond in it, and suddenly wildlife comes in the pond, and damselflies, and there's fish in the pond, and frogs come, and a hedgehog comes to the... So you build up biodiversity, and there's very, very clever ways of you know of calculating what biodiversity is now, and, and if you can add to that. And, and that language certainly in some wildlife trusts across and we're already now starting those conversations here we're working closely with Hartford Homes who are who are pushing the envelope on the island in terms of BNG in the Isle of Man in their projects and the whole of the development process is going that way so yeah biodiversity is it's wildlife and, and nature 
and you can start with nothing and you can add bits in and eventually you end up with a, a temperate rainforest. Some people, and I would understand why, there are there are good conservationists, on the, there are fantastic, I won't, I won't embarrass by saying who it is, but one particularly renowned and, and a, a guy who I've got a lot of respect for said to me once over lunch, Lee, I don't do pragmatism. <laughs> we can't, there's no room for it. But But that's where we differ because I don't feel that unless... Max Wildlife Trust works closely with farmers. You know, small gains across 75% of the island. And some of the things, some of the benefits that David Bellamy is already driving with those relationships and habitats that are being built. And I went to a farm late last night. I was out till one in the morning with Rob Fisher, our new farmland birds officer, looking at farmland scrapes and, and habitat for curlews and lapwings. That would not be happening. That's not a Manx Wildlife Trust nature reserve, and that would not be happening if, if we weren't at the coalface of the agri-environment scheme. So those small gains across our island could be far, 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 far more impactful than owning 0.5% of it as nature reserves. And, and then you bring Hannah in and, and Lucy and the other, you know, and Claire and Graham and Lamar and all those other people doing Team Wilder and getting corporates and people on board. And the, the opportunity... I'm not over-egging it. You know, we're never going to... We need to live here. I live in a house. I drive a car on a road. We've got to be pragmatic. Um, but the small gains we could get could be amazing. And I think that's the big thing, isn't it? Which is maybe one of the changes that's happened over the 50 years. And you think originally maybe people thought it was sort of set up to protect nature and just sort of work in conservation. And now here we are talking about this whole thing from hannah working right your way down at uh, you say at the sort of cliff face working with groups working with volunteers working with schools doing education and this sort of thing through the sort of working with with sort of developers and with builders and with sort of people around the island right up to working at sort of government and national level as well and i think that's really important for us and that's a i would say even if i wasn't ceo of max wildlife trust i would say that's a critically important role the, the agri-environment scheme is a great example the, you can imagine with the 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 the, the historic tension across the world between conservation and farming you know that me coming in and saying right we're going to bid for this agri-environment scheme you know some of our members and supporters and staff were, were questioning that is the agri-environment scheme good enough is it really doing enough for nature and I think the the, the way if you like I won the argument or the debate <laughs> was that if there was an you know if I didn't work for Manx Wildlife Trust and the Isle of Man government launched a new agri-environment scheme and I thought you know, I'd like it to be better for nature, but it's not really as good as I'd like it to be. Who would I want to deliver the agri-environment scheme to make it do as much as it possibly could for nature? Well, I'd want Manx Wildlife Trust to take it with two hands and use it as a real opportunity to make the agri-environment scheme as good as it possibly could be. And that's what we're trying to do. And do people, because I know David Bellamy's been, been doing a lot of work on this, it was an award winner, as I say, at the uh, Biosphere Awards last year. Do we? Can we sort of say now that most of the farmers on the Isle of Man do buy into this? Is, are there still sort of, do we still get pockets of resistance? Uh, I yep. know a lot of a lot of you know farmers have been farming the land for a long time. They might, again, might think this is the way we do it. I'm not interested. I'm sure that's the case. And, and I know not every farmer has applied for agri-environment initiatives. The numbers are going up. I empathise with that. I've, I've been a grower myself, so I do empathise. There's no, I'm not patronising in any way. Um, but I think that I would say that the tide is coming. The, the agri-environment tide across the whole of the developed world and probably globally in, in years to come is coming. And I think our role is to realise that farmers are really important in the Isle of Man and we all eat food, everything we eat has been farmed. So we need to have farmers and that's really important. I, I guess our ultimate is that we show the agri-environment scheme is really working well. The farmers all apply for it we spend all the government money and there's a whole waiting list of other agri-environment initiatives that want doing and then we flip and go and have a conversation with our government and say you know these farmers are on this now we've run out of money we need more money to really deliver what this agri-environment scheme needs to do so we're hoping that it quickly gets oversubscribed to show that the demand is there and we can really support our farmers to enable them to produce our food but at the same time do it in as nature friendly ways they can. Just looking at the, the project, because you had the uh, the big black tie ball. Sadly, I couldn't be there, which is a great shame, because I was rather hoping I could have been there for that one. But you had your uh, anniversary ball, uh, raising money and a specific conservation project. And this is the uh, bringing back the tree sparrow to the Max country. So tell us a little bit about that. Why why we honed in on this one species? Um, great example. I, my our colleague, David and Rob, 
would say that tree sparrow is the, the closest species in the island at the brink of extinction on the island. There are, they think, certainly a lot less than 100 birds oh, left on the island, m maybe scores of them or a score of them. Um, and we want to try and save them. Um, and we found a guy called Matt the Sparrow that we brought across to do a talk. David found him on Twitter and brought him across to do a talk for the Manx Ornithological Society. And, and inspired by Matt, um, we've now got some funding that's been donated by private donations. We've managed to employ Rob as a part-time birds officer, farmland birds officer, and his first project is to try and save the tree sparrows. And I guess there's two core ways. Well, first of all, we want to try and get sightings and, and get an accurate count of how many there are. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to involve keen birders, you know, Max Bird Life, Max Ornithological Society, anyone that, that's interested in birds to help us do that. Uh, and then we're buying bird feeders and, and nest boxes with very accurately sized 28 millimeter holes so that bigger sparrows can't get in. And we're going to try and do those interventions and, and try and bring, them, bring tree sparrows back from the brink. Hannah, you're out and about a lot, and a bit of a bird. Have you ever seen a, a tree sparrow? I've never in the seen a tree sparrow before. No, it, you know, there's really, really not many of them here. No, I mean, a hundred is. I think it's to be honest. I think it's yeah. I think it's yeah, much less than that. It's yeah, a sad. And do, sad do they have a stronghold in one part of the island? Do we know, or, or are they sort of of, of those who are here? Are they spread a bit or? I, can, yeah, they, I think they're spread a bit. There was yeah. a, one of our trustees was in this morning saying that there was a sighting in her back garden and her hubby's a real good birder. So last week there was a sighting up in Andreas. But at Pool Dewey, there was a, there was a veg pack down at Pool Dewey through the winter that was a, a place where people were seeing tree sparrows. I think David saw some there on Christmas Day with Rob. Um, and there's a couple of places, East Coast, there's another site. So there are a few places, but you know, speaking to a, a birder yesterday, he was telling me they were all over the island. So we're going to try and try and save them. It's a great project. Just finally, um, we mentioned obviously working with the government working with volunteer groups and the work that Hannah's been doing in a role as community ranger and, and also people might have seen in the news quite recently. Another part, again, is linking up. You're talking about working with developers, people like Harford, and also there's been this great link with uh, Island Escapes, which has been a sort of, again, a bit of a, I suppose, a bit of a hand-in-glove relationship in a way. You've got a company who look to have people staying in lovely homes around the island, teaming up with Max Wildlife Trust, and then presumably can also, you know, it's... People can enjoy going out and seeing the environment, and I think also they've they've done a, a partnership with the Wildlife Trust to sort of work with you as well on various schemes. Yeah, I I sit on the Visit Island Man Board with John John Keggin and John and Jamie, um, the key people at Island Escapes. They're a fantastic company. I think they're an example of how other corporates, you know, Lloyd's Bank International, are funding Hannah's role. Again, it's another great corporate. Utmost of sponsoring Onk and Max Telecom are, are sponsoring um, Cool Darry. So we've got some wonderful links with corporates but but island escapes and, and me and john have, have looked at ways that we can develop ecotourism together we think our values match um they've for the last few years have been having a, an option for their customers to donate to max wildlife trust and, and that's bringing in significant amount of over seven thousand pounds last year just from a tiny donation from their clients so yeah we're now looking at ways that we can potentially do some Max Wildlife Trust officers can go and do guided walks, you know, very personalised tours for some of John and Jamie's guests um, and developing other ideas as well. But yeah, it's 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 probably, it predates me and John sitting together on the Visit Island Man Board, but I think that's been a catalyst to try and push that because we're both really, really enthused about the ecotourism side. So just finally then, we'll skip forward 25 years. Here we are sitting around the table for the 75th anniversary of uh, the Max Wildlife Trust. Hannah's into her thirties, um, <laughs> and we're, we're older. <laughs> so, Hannah, where would you like to be if you were still sitting here? You're still still doing the community for angel, working in that role. Where would you like to see the work you're doing? Where would you like to have seen it to have developed? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, I don't know. I think just you know, if everyone was considering wildlife in their own sort of personal outdoor space. If you know, if you if it was common to go out into a garden and you know people were actively getting plants because they're helping pollinators or you know actively thinking about wildlife when they're 
you know, when they're out in their garden. You know, for a lot of people, that's really the case. So that's really great. But I think, yeah, just, you know, out in the community, just having sort of wildlife at the real forefront of people's minds a bit more. But like I said, I think we're on the way. So I, you know, I hope that that will be achieved. And V, if you were still at the top of the heap uh, at the Manx Wildlife Trust, where would you like to see the trust being? I think we would be in an island where people have really realised that not only we're a special place, but we shouldn't take it for granted and we've got to keep it a special place and that we are an exemplar biosphere in the world with a corporate healthy economy that's delivering sustainability goals, key places for wildlife and nature completely protected other places managed in a very very sustainable way and a a thriving agri-environment scheme with lots of tree sparrows and don't forget of course if you want to find out more about the island's wonderful wildlife you're in luck the sixth annual manx wildlife week takes place at venues across the isle of man from the 29th of april to the 7th of may with something for everyone from snorkeling safaris to silk painting details on the Manx National Heritage website. Thanks to Lee and Hannah for the talk. Here's to the next 50 years and in the meantime, we'll reconvene in 25 years time for the 75th.